Church Equipment, Revelation chapter 21. This is our last class. This is the last class ever. I'm not going to be teaching anymore in the Bible. Well, I guess that's not true. No, I'll be back for another another season. I don't know how long the the show is going to go on. All right. Revelation 21, verse 12. We'll read verse 12 and 13. <clears throat> And this one's about the gates. <clears throat> and had a wall great and high and had 12 gates, and at the gates were 12 angels and the names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Um, verse 13, on the east side three gates, on the north three gates, and on the, th uh, the south three gates, and on the west three gates. <clears throat> um, I want to read out of Ezekiel 48 now to just compare this to Ezekiel. Ezekiel 48, verse 32 through 35. <clears throat> and at the east side, 4,503 gates, and one gate of Joseph, one gate of Benjamin, one of Dan. The north side, 4,500 measures, and three gates, one of Simeon, one of Issachar, and one uh, gate of Zebulun. At the west side, four gates and 500 with their three gates, one gate of Gad, one of Asher, and one of Naphtali. It was round about uh, 18,000 measures, and the name of the city from that day shall be, the Lord is here. All right, they, there's some similarities, you notice that? <clears throat> sometimes the Lord waits to the end to show us things, and sometimes he shows us the end in the beginning. And um, in this case, <clears throat> all of this stuff being said and all about these tribes and all about these gates, it's just saying whatever you go through, whatever the name of them is, when you go in there, the Lord is there. <laughs> See, we go, oh, I wonder what this means. <laughs> I wonder, you know, we get all wrapped up in... We've got to understand all these great things and stuff. Let's just know that the Lord is there. Let's be about him. And, and then he'll show you beyond that. But, it, it, you know, I, I like Ezekiel's way. It's just, look, when it's all said and done, it's a gate to the Lord. Don't make a big deal out of it. Just keep your heart going to the Lord, always going to the Lord. And also remember <clears throat> that... These gates are entrances where, where, whereby we enter in and become part of New Jerusalem, the, the wife of the, of the Lamb. So at one point we were not functioning according to his heart. We were functioning according to ministry or this or that. <clears throat> um, and then uh, back to Revelation in verse 21, <clears throat> it says this, and the 12 gates were 12 pearls. And the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent gold. <clears throat> so I wrote, the gates are made of a single pearl. This speaks of how we respond to irritation. <laughs> because that's how a pearl is formed. A pearl, uh, there's an oyster, and they get sand in there, and they get sand inside, and it irritates, and it secretes this stuff, and when, it get, when they get done, it's formed a pearl. Did y'all know that's how a pearl is formed? Because <laughs> that's how it's formed. <clears throat> Don't y'all ever watch PBS anyway? <clears throat> <clears throat> um, the, the gates are made of a single pearl. This speaks of how we respond to irritation because really it's, it's formed from this irritation. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't have to react that way. It doesn't have to get the pearl of great price, which is Christ formed in him. It doesn't have to, 
that can just respond to irritation in a negative way. We pass through it for and by Christ, the pearl of great price in us, or we do, or do we, or do we simply become irritated, resulting in nothing formed of eternal value? <clears throat> and this just goes along with what we've said the whole time of the book of Revelation, that the book of Revelation and all the trials and everything that's in there that pertain to us are meant to pertain to Christ being formed in us and to us being built a habitation for the slaughtered lamb. <clears throat> this is the goal. And that, so here you have these entries and these, the, you know, because we just read, well, this is this and this and that and whatever. But if you're going to enter in, you are going to enter in from, from one pearl, pearl of great price, but it's that process. You're going to enter in because you, you came through the process, because you uh, didn't just see everything as irritating. Uh, you know, the, the amazing thing is, <clears throat> it's like what I was talking to you about last class. I mean, I'm just thinking of this. The amazing thing is the sand is no longer there when it gets done. It's not going, oh, the sand, the sand. It has taken there and formed the pearl of great price in them, in them. And I'm, you know, I know, you know what? I, I know about irritation. No, I do. I do. Well, at least, at least this, I've heard tell <laughs> about them. <clears throat> Kelly says, and here we are. <clears throat> yeah, it scares me when it says, God says, I shall make thee as the sands, or the sands of, the I'm going, no. <clears throat> But, but in, in reality, this is interesting that the gates are made of one pearl and that every one of them are that and that every one of them require to get into there, there has to be that forming and that work. And, and irritation, uh, things like that that come, I mean, I, you know, there are, um, I th here's what I think. I think the process is that it is an irritation at first. And that's why it secretes this, this Christ, this thing that's going to form into something. And then, you, you know, after a while, and it's still in you. See, this isn't talking about, well, someday. I mean, yes, it does take a process. But it is, the pearl is still in you, but the, but the irritation is not still there. It is so, and you know, the amazing thing is they're always so round. You know, you don't see a pearl that's like oblong or something like that, you know, and go, oh, that's weird, you know. <laughs> I like your pearls, you know, they're all weird looking. <clears throat> you know, that's really different you're wearing there. The, the beauty of it is that it's been formed and turned every which way until it has been molded into that pearl of great price. And pearls are expensive, you know, they, they're expensive. But the cost to the oyster is, it's nothing. This is, you know, it has that, you know, I'm referring it to that juice. It has that juice, that whatever in it that can be secreted that can begin to take sand and form it like that. It's, there's something within it. And there's something within you and I by the Holy Spirit where we can do that. We do not have to live in irritation on this earth because we because the goal is not to live on this earth it's to live in him you say well, I want to live in heaven live in him you know it's about living in him and these are I mean you know you can say well I don't think that's what that means okay that's fine but it goes along perfectly with everything that's been said and so um, it's like, you know, we can, we, can just, we can just not see. We can just not see and miss. Or we can see 
Jesus and see these things as opportunities for more of Jesus and less of me, less irritation, less reaction. Um, by what? By means of what? That these grains can be molded into forming Christ in me. And, and I want Jesus. I don't want to just be an oyster. I want Jesus in me. See? And it's like another thing formed within him, a thing of beauty, a thing of treasure. <clears throat> so, um, so I say, we, we pass through it for and by Christ, the pearl of great price in us. Or do we simply become irritated, resulting in nothing formed of eternal value? And that's, that's the thing. I mean, you know, we can pass through this life and just, just end up a better Christian at the end, but not Christ formed in us. Why well, I'm better than I was. You know, I'm, folks... From when I got saved, I was better than I was with almost no change. <laughs> you know, <what> I, mean? <laughs> I mean that's how bad I was. <clears throat> uh, these gates of pearl are the method for entering in to become New Jerusalem, the wife of the Lamb. Uh, so let me read again out of Ezekiel, <clears throat> Ezekiel 48, verse 35. And the name of the city from that time will be, The Lord is there. So I wrote, Let us never forget that the Lord who will be ever present within her is the Lamb. <clears throat> Do you see the Lamb in that forming process? The Lord is there. But he is not just Lord as in being a potentate, but is her husband enthroned in love within her being. And, you know, I mean... I, Uh, sadly, for his sake, I, I think so much of a, that what we do in these realms are just because we perceive them as Christian ways or we, we, we miss out on his love in it and we don't respond with our love toward him for it. I think that, I think that he gets robbed a lot. And you see that. I mean, you see that in, in Hosea, and you see that in so many places. Um, but, we don't, oh, but maybe we don't see it. Maybe we don't see it. Maybe we see just a prophet's tale of what's wrong and, you know, and, and usage, usage of uh, symbolism instead of in there lies his heart, and I need to quit reading this like a scholar, a Bible scholar or something. I need to change my approach. I need to see enough of him that, you know, you know, if you'll draw me on this level, we'll run. You know, on this level, Song of Solomon level. Not just draw me as a Christian, you know. Zombies, I, I'm coming to you. I love you, Jesus. You know, he's going, thanks. That feels real good. All that slime you got. <laughs> feels really great. I'm glad you came. <clears throat> um, if anyone is looking for the lamb, if you are bride, then they should be able to find him in you at any time. He and his bride are one. His life and his bride were crucified together. Did you know that? We were crucified together. Can we, can we instead of theologically be crucified with Christ, can we enter into that in one spirit with him together? I mean, that's completely different. It's just different. And, you know, you can say, well, that's just sloppy agape. You know, that's just silly gooey stuff. I just want to know the depth. <laughs> okay, we just keep going. Maybe the Holy Spirit will get you. I don't know what to say. I, can't, I cannot change your heart. Those are heart issues. They are heart issues. <clears throat> his life and his bride were crucified together. The bride is his body.
the Lord is there. Remember, the name of the city from that time will be, that's what you're going to be called, the Lord is there. It's talking about the city, New Jerusalem. From now on, but remember how it got there. And the, I saw the presence of the Lord and the glory of God coming, and then it came in, and then it filled the temple. Remember the scriptures there in Ezekiel, and it filled the temple, and da 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 da, and it says all this stuff, and then it says, and she shall no longer be called whatever that uh, from that, from, and the name of the city from that time will be once, once he's come in. She's going to be called the Lord is there. <laughs> I just can't. Remember. What scripture was that in the scripture? Ezekiel 48, verse 35. <clears throat> it is Christ in you, the hope of glory. This should be the highest goal of our daily aspirations that the Lamb is there, that there in that place, the only true fellowship that He has is her one after his kind. All right. Um, <clears throat> let's go back to Revelation 21. <clears throat> um, let's see if I've even got it written here. I don't see it. We're going to read... 15 through 17. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city, to measure the city and the gates of it and its walls. So everything, he's measuring the gates according to pearl and according to every. It's not just numbers. He's measuring it by what's in her. The enthroned slaughtered lamb <clears throat> uh, to measure the city and the gates of it in its wall and the city lieth four square and the length is as large as the breadth and he measured the city with the reed 12,000 furlongs the length and the breadth and the height of it are equal and he measured the wall of it in 140 and four cubits according to the measure of a man that is of the angel <clears throat> all right let me let me just ask you, this measuring part, does this sound familiar to anybody outside of the book of Revelation? What are you waving back there, Kelly? Ezekiel. Oh, but Ezekiel, he spends chapter after chapter after chapter telling us secrets. Like, like the Lord is there, not mentioned in Revelation. And he, but he's, you know, and, and this habitation shall be called the throne of God. He, he, he tells little secrets of the heart of the Lord in there. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> let's see. Um, um, gosh. Well, I've got uh, Ezekiel... 41.4, and I didn't put it in my little book. Uh, Ezekiel 41.4 <clears throat> saith unto us, So he measured its length 20 cubits and the breadth 20 cubits before the temple, and he said unto me, This is the most holy place. Do you notice how just every once in a while, the Lord says to him while he's measuring, he says something astounding. And, we, you know, you can get into this measuring thing in Ezekiel and go, my God, this is boring. Or you can go, you can get there and say, uh, there's nuggets of his heart and I want to hear. I don't want to miss that. I don't want to read over the top of his heart. You know, it's kind of like driving down the road and there's his heart. And boom, 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 what was that? You know, and you just keep on going. <clears throat> he measured the most holy place then. <laughs> he measured the most holy place. This is where the image of God is seated and shines. This is where the lamb is enthroned. This is, this is where the image of God is found. As New Jerusalem, this is not just the dwelling place of God, but the dwelling place and enthronement of the lamb. 
Um, gosh. All right. Um, I was hoping I had all this stuff in here. Uh, Psalm 68. <coughs> Psalm 68 and verse uh, 18. <clears throat> thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive, thou hast received gifts of men for yea, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord might dwell among them. <clears throat> because if the Lord dwells and it is in them, because we know that from the lamb being enthroned on the within her and we know it because the word words along here are uh, let's see let me make sure yes among them is in italics and is not in the original <clears throat> um, that goes along with Ephesians 4 13 we've gone over this a little bit but I'm just going to read it again to remind you that all of the Old Testament and the New Testament mesh together and that the writers of the New Testament did not have a New Testament. They only had the Old Testament, and that's where they saw all this stuff from, and you can see it in there also. <clears throat> Ephesians 4, 13, till we all come, because it says it just before this, see? Um, verse 7, for every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ, how much of him we have. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? And he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all uh, heavens that he might save all things. Oh, I'm sorry fill all things and he gave <clears throat> some apostles prophets, evangelists pastor teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of christ till we all come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the son of god unto a, a perfect man not perfect men a perfect man under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And he took the reed and he measured. And he took the reed and he measured. And he took the reed and he measured unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Not you. He's not measuring you. Book of Revelation, he's measuring us and da-da-da-da. Not if you're his. He's measure, he measures you by Christ. And it, aren't we the temple? Isn't, aren't we the house of the Lamb? Isn't that where he said, will be my dwelling place? And it's being measured. But it's according to the measure of the stature of fullness of Christ. <clears throat> um, so... This is the one we are to conform to, the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ. We conform to his measure as his body, because it's the house that's being measured. I mean, if the body isn't measured up to him, he can't live through us. If it's, if it's, if it's just jerking around and doing whatever it thinks is right, and he's wanting something different, he's wanting that which will follow his spirit and nature and mind, <clears throat> He gives gifts even to the rebellious, but the end game is that he will dwell there in us. This is the measure. These verses, uh, Ephesians 4, 7 through 13, these verses are describing he who ascended. It is the one who descended, who got low, who died on a cross. He ascended, the slaughtered lamb ascended. He led captives in triumph. What does he ascend? What does he ascended mean except that he first first gave himself in death because uh, there's no resurrection without death he that descended is the very one who became higher than the heavens with the intent on filling the whole universe this is the lamb the slaughtered lamb this and that's what it's saying here in Ephesians uh, it was the crucified who gave some apostles some prophets the crucified who ascended 
who gave that. The crucified gave them with one intention, that they might work toward one end, to work on individual Christians till they come to the place of being built together, edified. The word edified is the word built, like a house. Built together, edified as his body, a body for the crucified. A body for the cruise until we all come become mature, which is defined by attaining the whole measure of the full stature and co full comprehension of the one, the crucified, he that descended, by whom we are inhabited. Now, it says that right here, but we get so used to scriptures, you know, well, I know what that says, and we rewrite over it, but... You know, the Holy Spirit knows Jesus' heart, and we don't. And so we have to go, I just don't want to read this with my own mind again. I've already, every year, every day, all the time, constantly, I get the same thing out of this. Show me what you're saying. And then all of a sudden you start seeing, it's the crucified. It's he that descended that is here. And he's wanting us to come to his measure as the crucified. And I know that's a lot, a lot to read to you, but we're, this is it. This is the last class, you know. So, and you can always get the tape, right? <clears throat> uh, Ephesians 4:13. Until we all reach unity in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Him. The inward image of Christ is seen best in the bride. I mean, that's just an amazing fact. You know, isn't it? I mean, oh, I would think he would be seen best in the apostles. It's funny, you got this gate, and he says, this is, this is one of the 12 tribes. This gate's called Gad. You know, you go, wow. You know, it's one pearl. It's him oh, yeah. in Gad. It's not about Gad. Oh, I hope I get my... You know, I want a gate. I want to have my name on a gate. Yikes. Become a pearl, maybe, you know, let the pearl be formed in you, and then maybe they'll see a big pearl instead of, well, that's Gad. You know? There's just so much of us in all of this. <clears throat> um, okay, I'm going to read. Uh, we're going to talk about measuring the altar. Are you all up for that? Measuring the altar, it's a big deal in Ezekiel. It is, and it's, it's eye-opening. And I know this because Kelly has searched Ezekiel head and toe, and she knows everything that there ever was to say here. So, <laughs> And I hope your name is on one of the gates one day. I, I'm only teasing. I don't know why I didn't pick on Mike. I just I, I switched it there for a minute, brother. I'm sorry, you know, <laughs> you forgive me for not. <laughs> okay, Ezekiel 43, 13. Uh, see, I, I mean, Ezekiel, did I, what did I say? Okay, Ezekiel 43, 13. See, I thought I put all these down so I wouldn't have to look them up and waste time so we could move fast. And I, apparently this last part, I failed you all and should be consigned to the pit. <laughs> okay, Ezekiel 43, 13. And these are the measures of the altar after the cubits. The cubit is a cubit and, and a hand width. Even the bottom shall be a cubit, and the breadth a cubit, and the border of it by the, its edge roundabout shall be a span, and this shall be the higher place of the altar. Let's see, uh, this may go all the way down, it does. And from the bottom upon the ground, even to the lower ledge shall be two cubits, and the breadth cubit, and from the smaller ledge, even to the greater ledge shall be four cubits, and the breadth one cubit. So the altar shall be four cubits, and from the altar and upward shall be uh, four horns, and the altar shall be 12 cubits long, 12 broad, square <clears throat> in the four squares of it, and the ledge shall be 14 cubits uh, let's see, let me just make sure. <clears throat> Talks about the stairs. Verse 18. Um, verse 18, and he said unto me, Son of man, thus saith the Lord God. These are the ordinances of the altar in the day when they shall make it. 
to offer burnt offerings on it and to sprinkle blood on it. <clears throat> All right, so measuring the altar. <clears throat> My words here. I fear that the cross or the altar that God has in mind is bigger than what we suppose. The measuring, I, I fear that it's bigger than what we've measured it. Our measurement usually only pertain to salvation from punishment and hell. God's measurement goes far beyond that. For example, Romans 6, 6 reveals that our old nature was crucified with Christ. A person can choose to believe that and add it to his theology. But inwardly, maybe unknowingly in his daily life, he may choose to remain alive. Because <clears throat> he's added it to his theology. In truth, every believer should carry around an altar within himself. This altar is to be revealed when we lay down our lives for the undeserving. The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. This situation involves two swords. One was the Lord's, but the other, was one, the other one was Gideon's. Jesus' sword is the cross. Gideon's sword is the application of the cross. Have we allowed the Holy Spirit to measure the altar for us with his rod, or have we merely glanced at it and made our own guess as to its dimensions? Sadly, the gospel is not more effective than it could be because we believe that merely <clears throat> uh, talking to people about the altar, the cross, we, we share the cross, we talk about the cross, is enough to bring forth fruit. We believe that. We have not measured the death of Christ and seen that it has reached even unto us. Only those who bear the death of the cross will, will find true fruit, fruitfulness. John 12, 24 reveals the true path to fruitfulness, except the corner wheat fall on the ground and die. But if it died, bringeth forth much fruit. If one does not embrace our death with Christ, we will remain a single, impotent seed. <clears throat> but if a death takes place, it will produce many seeds. Jesus stated that if he is lifted up from the earth, referring to crucifixion, this act and reality will draw all men. In other words, if we're lifted up with him in reality, it's going to it's going to have an effect on people in a real way. This means that his death will draw men to him who is crucified. They will not merely be drawn for salvation, but to death as God's means for fruitfulness. If we proceed in the same manner, then our death with Christ will have increased results also. And the other increase is not merely more who will become dying seeds, but there will be an increase of Christ in us. As we die, then he is able to become our resurrection. <clears throat> in Romans 12, 1 through 2, we find a New Testament example of when Paul says that he is beseeching them with the measuring the altar or the death of Christ. I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord, which is your reasonable service. <clears throat> when Paul speaks of the mercies of God, he means his mercy is seen in offering himself. And when he tells us to not conform to the world, he is telling us to not be the opposite of the crucified, as we always proceed in a way that saves self. His version of a renewed mind, be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. His version of a renewed mind is to have a mind of sacrifice. Present your bodies, a living sacrifice. This can be seen in Philippians 2, 5. Look how Paul describes his mind in 2 Timothy 4, 6. I am ready being poured out as a drink offering. That's what Paul says. That's how he describes his mind. Because he's taken on the mind of the crucified, the mind of the lamb. <clears throat> Romans 12 is telling you that 
you can judge things by self-preservation and self-exaltation or by sacrifice, that you may know what is the, the, the true will of God. Um, <clears throat> your choice of which in crisis and in unfair treatment is what defines you before God. He sees you as a sheep or goat, as a tare or as wheat seed. He knows you have not embraced the death in a real way because a living person is what he encounters from us on a regular basis instead of crucify. One proof is that we war against what wars against us. We war against what wars against us. Samson could continue to battle the Philistines on an individual basis as he encountered their deceit and corruption, or he could choose to be the one that dies but we know that he slew many more by death than by life. In the same manner, Jesus' ministry and teaching did not change men. That's a shocking statement to some. Jesus, in the same manner, Jesus' ministry and teaching did not change men. It was solely his death that made the difference. The power of God is found in weakness, and the nature of God is best revealed through death, loss, and weakness. Our goal should be to impart divine life, not merely to impart a message or of salvation. That is the difference between Jesus' ministry on earth and his ministry on the cross. No matter how successful our ministry may appear, if we are not building the image of Christ into them, then we have failed the heart and intention of God. When Jesus came, he came as the express image of God. His goal was that people would see the Father in him. The plan is still the same for us. Just as we could see the image of God in Jesus, so his will is that others see his image in us. The change we have been brought to by his death is not merely salvation or lack of sin. Doctrine does not work the image of God in us that he requires. We claim we are preaching the word of life, but the definition of life found in that statement is not that we may have an extended life in heaven, eternal life as, as we call it, the word of life is communicating to others that Christ is now the life and image that God desires from us. Ezekiel 43, 11, if they become ashamed of what they have done, at that point you make known to them the pattern of the temple. Write it down for their study because their only salvation from all those deeds is if they become faithful to its design and regulations. I think that's the NIV. So, speaking of the wife of the Lamb, in Revelation, the entire city replaces the other temple in that she is that city and is the dwelling place of God. The dwelling place of God is with man, and that city has replaced the temple. And in Revelation, it says there's no more temple. Remember that? You say, well, the lamb is the temple, but she is the place. But she's not. But see, here's the deal. She's not the temple. She is the house, the dwelling place of the slaughtered lamb. <clears throat> in Revelation, the entire city replaces the other temple in that she is that city and is the dwelling place of God. The temple was always known as the dwelling place of God, but she has taken its place. But while she replaces former temper, temples, there will yet be a temple there. Uh, Revelation 21, 22 doesn't say, and listen to this, now this is Revelation 21, 22, doesn't say there is no temple, but that he saw no temple except that God was it. Now, 
In this scenario, she is not the temple, but in fact, the temple within her is God and the Lamb. Revelation 3.12, in that verse, to overcome means to and results in, this is my last statement, the name of the city of God, New Jerusalem, being written on you, being written on you. Father, we just thank you for giving us this time during these classes and to use them as an excuse to sit at your feet and not just sit in a class. We thank you that you've You've used it to allow the Holy Spirit to move, even quietly within each of us, but to move, to draw out not our hunger for knowledge or a desire to explain certain scriptures, but to draw us out under your heart like Eliezer did with Rebecca, with the bride-to-be. She wasn't a bride till he had finished communicating his heart. When she went into that tent, she was already ready for oneness with him. And Lord, we just thank you that your word is living. It's not just scripture. It's living. It is full. It is like trees that, of life. It is like uh, flourishing gardens. It is like precious ointment flowing down from your head to us, the body. And may, may we not move on to the next class, or nor stay in this class but may we move at your feet and may in every class, may our heart be, I wanna, I wanna lay my head on your breast, Jesus. I wanna hear your heartbeat. I want to move from sitting at the far end of the table and barely hearing what you're saying, but still eating the communion that everyone else is eating. I want to get up like John, and I want to be able to lean and hear your heart. And I want, I want to know you. I want to know you. I want to know what's in you. I want to know your ways and your mind and your spirit and your nature. So, Lord, grant us these gifts, these blessings, these incredible um, gifts that we could we could do that. We could, we could hear your heart in everything. And in so doing that you would be formed within us. And that in being formed, every irritation would be captivated and brought in to form your image in us more and more. And not enemies, but workers for us while we look not at the sand and the irritations. We look not. For Lord, you didn't say to look at the irritations and the eternal things. You said don't look at the irritations and the sand. Let's just let it work and be thankful that we're gonna get more of you. For we ask in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. We're not only done, I mean dismissed, but we're done with this class. God bless you all.